Hello everyone, this is Kim Davis, Executive Editor of DMN, welcoming you all to today's webcast, Managing E-Commerce Across Borders. Uh, just a couple of things before we begin. We'll make available a set of slides to you following the uh, webcast. And do remember, one of the reasons we're here is to answer your questions, so please type them in as soon as you have them, and we'll see how many we can get to later on. The webcast is presented by by DMN and sponsored by Smartling. I'll be presenting today and then moderating the Q&As and we'll be getting input on your questions from Smartling's Head of Marketing, Juliana Pereira. And before we get started, a word about our sponsors. Smartling was founded in 2009 and headquartered in New York City with offices around the world. Founders Jack Welder and Andre Axelrod recognize that translation is a growing requirement for companies with global aspirations. They also found that legacy content localization methods weren't scalable due to the manual processes that slowed speed to market, lacked measurable translation quality, and became too expensive. So Jack and Andre developed an innovative end-to-end -end localization solution that combines leading translation software and a network of professional translators. Smartling's unique software-backed solution helps ambitious brands and global companies access more markets, more customers, and greater value. So into the topic. I'm sure I don't need to define e-commerce. It's been around more than 20 years. Uh, the thing I'd like to draw your attention to to start off, though, is the quantity of web content that's required for even a fairly lean and modest e-commerce operation. This scheme you're looking at is just something I pulled off the internet, showing a very basic setup. Um, you can see that at a glance it's talking about 25 or 30 web pages just for one fairly simple centralized website. And that's before you even start adding extra product pages or catalog pages. In itself, that's quite a lot of content. If you're actually going to keep it up to date, refresh it, and the people doing it are probably also doing email campaigns, social media content, newsletters, and so on. And this is a very basic and easy setup. But that's probably not your world if you're interested in the topic of today's webcast. Uh, I spoke to a well-known US airline recently. Their head of marketing estimated they have about 8,000 pages of content which they need to keep up to date. Even a fairly medium-sized B2C operation whether it's in retail, travel, hospitality, it's going to have at least hundreds of pages of web content. And uh, well, you might not have expected this a few years ago. I can tell you I've spoken to nonprofits recently, charitable, educational, well-being promotion organizations, and the way they're running their, their web properties is very much in a digital marketing way, very much like B2C companies. And also an interesting big change people have been commenting on over the last year or so is the importance of e-commerce in B2B. I think it's a Forrester figure, something like 67% of the B2B journey is now completed online. So the B2B space is expanding its commercial online presence, whether you want to call it strictly e-commerce or not. And as soon as you get away from the very simple model I put up earlier, into, you get to a very complex infrastructure. You probably still have a central hub, and for most US companies, even if you're doing international e-commerce, that's likely to be in English. Some global businesses, of course, are decentralized, and they have a, a number of hubs in, in different regions. Or you might have a central hub and then subsidiary websites for Europe, APAC, for individual countries. Maybe you have landing pages for specific campaigns or offers. You might set up uh, microsites, which are more elaborate, but they're still temporary. And, of course, although we'll hardly be able to scratch the surface of it today, let's not forget mobile. There's the mobile web, and of course there's apps. That's a lot of digital property, and that really is the key backdrop to the conversation that we're having. Of course, if you have a lot of digital property, you also have a content challenge. These are some, uh, some figures or some comments I got from a well-known uh, collaboration platform. 60% of marketers create at least one new piece of content per day. You need fresh content for your website, for apps, emails, newsletters. And of course, if you have any content challenge, 
You also have a DAM challenge, that's digital asset management. All this content needs to be managed, needs to be shared uh, among employees, it needs to be protected, tagged. You need to be able to find it again. You need not to have to reinvent content because you know you did it before, but you just can't track it down. Well, that, that's a whole other world of pain. And yes, oh dear. But of course, brands you know, face these challenges whether they're marketing across borders or not. And in various ways, they're up to meeting them. It's all those twists and turns the challenges take as you start to cross borders that we're here to talk about today. I'm going to speak about the general concepts involved and some general approaches to solving them. And obviously, the specifics are going to be very different depending uh, which type of business you're in, who you're marketing to, uh, your different degrees of international business. Um, when it comes to meeting the challenges, this is a competitive space as well. And I'm not describing, when I'm talking about how to, to meet the challenges, I'm not describing any one specific tech offering. Um, I'm basing my remarks on the various things which I've seen in the market. So managing e-commerce across borders. In this world, this diverse world, we could be talking about literal borders, or we could be talking about virtual borders, especially in a country like the United States. Obviously, if you're a, a US business looking for customers in Latin America or Europe or China, that's a clearly defined set of challenges. But I've also quite recently spoken to banks and airlines based in, in the United States. They're trying to acquire and retain customers in a market, a local market, which is diverse linguistically and culturally. And what a day to mention healthcare, but, but obviously that's very true of healthcare too. One of the biggest industries in the country, one of the biggest industries in the world. And within national borders, dealing with customers who want to be met in their own preferred language. And to keep it simple, I'll be assuming for the purpose of these remarks that you're reaching out across frontiers from an English-speaking and probably US-based hub. You're going to be approaching these challenges a little differently if you have key teams based in different territories, if you're the kind of brand which has uh, a big, office, big offices in a number of, of, of continents. But they're, they're really the same challenges. And the challenge is all about localizing your content, which means making it relevant for the people you're speaking to, translating it, and also and this is very important too, making it culturally appropriate. Updated, relevant, personalized content. These are the kinds of things marketers are talking about in these days of marketing automation when because of the amount of data available out there and the solutions we have for managing it, we can increasingly offer to prospects and customers an experience which is relevant to them which is seamless across channels. But of course, if you're going to do that across borders as well as across channels, that has to incorporate meeting them in the language they prefer to speak. And also, if you're doing e-commerce, in a currency which they're prepared to spend. I just remember once there was a bug in my Amazon account which meant that all the prices they were showing me was in some very obscure currency. I didn't know what it was. I was completely lost, of course, and had to contact Amazon and say, can you put it back into dollars? And also meeting them in the language they prefer to speak, you're also meeting them in their own culture if you're going to make the experience relevant and comfortable for them. Now, the content challenge when it comes to meeting people in their own languages and in their own cultures, it's important to recognize this can be very difficult for you if you're running a lean marketing team. And I, I know there are some real household name brands. If you actually look at the size of their marketing team in-house, it can be pretty small. It's obvious why that would be a challenge. But it can also be a challenge if you're a big enterprise where you have hundreds of, of employees in offices around the world just pushing out content every day. Equally difficult, maybe more difficult. Talk a little bit more about content. Echo with the subject of a whole other webcast. Um, 
somebody told me recently that more than 70% of B2B and B2C companies plan on creating more content in the coming year. There's a challenge of coordinating and communicating across teams. Companies struggle with their content marketing programs because there's a lot of content out there. The audience is almost sated with content, which means that the quality of the content constantly needs to be higher. That means a climbing cost, and that's a real mountain to climb when you extend that challenge across borders and into other languages, <laughs> which does bring us to, I think it's a picture of the Tower of Babel. Um, I won't bother re recounting the Tower of Babel story, but uh, yeah, I remember when translation used to work like this. I used to live next door to someone who was a professional translator. Someone would find a document they need translated, contact them, send them the document, they'd read it, they'd translate it, they would then send their translation back to their client, client would look at it or come back for changes. In the old pre-digital world, where you just needed lots of documents translated, it was a hands-on, slow, and expensive business. And of course, it was hard to evaluate the outcome, because after all, the reason you're sending the document to a translator, presumably you don't speak the language yourself. So there was a lot of time involved, a lot of cost. Now, of course, we're now in this new digital environment where we're trying to market at scale to enormous audiences, and the translation model, for a lot of companies at least, hasn't really changed much. How are you going to apply that old model to hundreds or thousands of web pages, especially when you have these constant demands for new and fresh content, and as I just said, a demand for high quality content? You can spend a lot of money on creative, on developing your content, but then what's the point for a lot of your markets if when they get it, they've got it in a bad, misleading, or inappropriate translation? What's the solution? Do you bring hundreds of translators in-house? Probably not. You more like, likely outsource it. You may face the same challenges for emails, for your social media. And the expectation of consumers today is that your responses, your ways of contacting them, have much greater velocity than taking a week to translate uh, an offer or some campaign message into another language. So how do you make it work? We've seen that there are problems with the traditional model of translation. Of course, you can do cheap outsourcing. You just go online and search for any language translated. You know, there's countless translation services out there. You don't know if they're any good. You don't know how fast they're going to be, how reliable they're going to be. Now, let's not throw those two ideas out, though, because another thing you can do is layer a triage approach on top of those two models, by which I mean simply this. Uh, there may be a lot of content on your web pages which is fairly straightforward, fairly simple. It doesn't require nuances. It's not really where you're trying to touch the customer at their heart. And maybe um, fairly inexpensive translation, simple translation is the way to go with that. Whereas for your, your top content, your quality premium content, you're going to look for people who really understand it and, and can really make it work. Now, the key to all this is technology, because, of course, this doesn't all have to reduce to a human approach anymore. There are solutions available sitting in, of course, the cloud. They can sit between the main hub and the various websites in different languages. When a website out in the regions which is not in English, sends a request back to the English origin site for a updated translation, the, the, the origin site can send it back pretty fast, almost in real time. Now, does that mean 
that we had translators sitting in the cloud translating pages to respond to these requests from the other language sites? Well, no, of course not. The way it generally works when I've sat down and spoken to the people who are providing these solutions is that what they're doing is continually crawling the hub site, the main site, whichever site the client has directed them to, the site where the fresh content is going up. They're continually crawling it. They're identifying fresh content as it's produced and published, and then they're embarking on the translation. This gets you uh, well ahead in terms of time. It gets you greatly advanced in the translation process. Now, when the, uh, the content is triggered to go live by one of the sites in the other language, then the translated content is likely ready. But let's not forget the cultural aspect as well. When you cross borders, you meet different cultures, ideas, and consumer attitudes. You need your digital presence to be not just linguistically, but culturally appropriate. You can send someone an offer in the right language, but are you inadvertently launching it on a religious holiday? Or maybe you're, you're launching it on, a, on an occasion which it will be appropriate to refer to. Different cultures are sensitive to the types of personalities that appear in commercial messages. There are price sensitivities. Some cultures don't like to see big price leaps. Obviously, there's a lot of cultural sensitivity when it comes to images. Now, again, there are solutions out there which can not only provide the translation services in advance, but also have the granular cultural knowledge alongside the translation skills. Now, there's clearly a human touch here, as there is with the translation. But the automation, the technological aspect, the possibility of doing a lot of this in advance in the cloud means you're getting to where you want to be much faster. It's obvious in this day and age that marketers want to meet customers where they are. And when you hear that, and you hear that a lot, they usually mean where they are in terms of channel or device. But you better be meeting them in their preferred language and in their culture too. And there are various ideas, again, I, I, I've seen which can promote this. For example, if a lot of your traffic is going to uh, one website, an English language website, let's say, and you understand that a lot of that traffic might have a preferred language other than English, the data which can surround the visitors to, to your website, data you're collecting, can tell you that they may prefer to be contacted, to be messaged in a different language. And you can have an automated pop-up or a light box which gives them the option to go to your other website which is likely in their preferred language. And they can also, um, they can also check that as their default for future visits. That means you start directing them to the right place instantly rather than, than them always having to come to a, a site which is not in their preferred language and be puzzled. Now, I've heard, I've heard two opinions on that. Some people say um, that you might see a drop in traffic if you start sending people to, to a site where you think it's their preferred language. It might not be. But I've heard people say that even if you do see a drop in traffic, you actually might still see an increase in conversions because you're actually getting the right people there. You're getting the people there who will understand that environment, be comfortable within it, and make a purchase. But I've also heard people say that actually, you put these kinds of things in place, you actually see an increase in traffic generally. Now, for most businesses, although this is a big challenge, the parameters are actually fairly limited. At one extreme, um, just a few days ago, I spoke with an electronics e-commerce brand, which has a global business. They're selling uh, gadgets and cables and stuff to people all over the world. And I asked them out of curiosity, knowing I was going to be given this talk, what they did about translation. And they kind of looked at me as if I'd asked a strange question. They were like, well, that's all in English. And of course, that might work for that space. If they're selling their product mainly to young professionals, cosmopolitan, uh, market, people are happy reading English, they can cope with it. So, you know, one extreme, <laughs> for, for a few companies, maybe this doesn't matter so much. 
Um, but for most companies who are doing e-commerce across borders, we're at least talking probably about relatively few languages. I mean, English, Spanish, and Chinese covers an awful lot of the commercial world. If you're in travel, maybe it gets more complicated. But there are solutions in the market which will take you to any exotic language you need to go to. Pretty remarkable. And in case you're wondering, quite randomly, that slide is in Albanian. So those are the main points I had to make. Let's start getting to your questions. If you haven't sent questions already, this would be a good time to start um, sending them in. Here to help me answer the questions, I'd like to introduce Juliana Pereira. She's the Senior Director of Marketing at Smartling. She joined the team almost two years ago. She has 13 plus years of experience in marketing and e-commerce, having worked at large and small businesses alike, from launching startups to leading cross-functional teams at a Fortune 500 company. Welcome, Juliana. Hi, thank you, Kim. Nice to meet. Nice to be on today. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, I thought uh, three or four questions coming in. Um, let me start with this one. I'll ask you this one. How do you choose, as a brand, how many languages in which you want to start localizing your messages? Is there a certain number of languages you should start with? That's a great question. And we come up on this question often with customers who approach us. And so first, we always consider the strategy. You know, what markets are you targeting? Um, and always start with looking at the data. You know, if you're getting a lot of traffic from, you know, France or Germany or a specific market, start seeing if, uh, you know, that might be the best place to start. So the next step would also be to consider a budget. So a lot of customers typically don't have a lot of budget earmarked for localization. It ends up just rolling under a marketing budget or a dev budget, and so there's always that budgetary constraint there. So if you have a small budget, plan your strategy around translating your content for maybe one or two languages instead of 15, um, because this can help you create that proof of concept, and then you can start showing the payback to your stakeholders as you roll out a couple of languages at a time. And then, of course, you know this will help make the case for expanding into additional languages and markets. So if this is your first time localizing a website or a web app or your business is still scaling, we always recommend that you start with a few languages to set yourself up for success and, and go from there. But of course, we have other customers who already have a strong presence in dozens of markets, so they want to go out the gate with dozens of languages, and of course, you know, they have a robust strategy and integrated strategy in place to support that. What you said first there is quite interesting because it suggests there are some brands which might not right out of the gate know which languages they should be meeting their, their, their market in. I mean, is it possible that brands could be mistaken about which languages they should be prioritizing? Well, I think it depends on the brand, and of course, every brand, like they, they know their analytics and they know their, they have access to their own data. So typically, they don't come to us not having any idea of what to translate into, but oftentimes, they're trying to decide between, you know, should it be these 10 languages or, you know, which ones should we prioritize first? Okay, let's look at the data. Okay, maybe these two or three markets are showing the most promise because, uh, for example, maybe they're getting a lot of traffic but low conversion rates. That's usually a, a strong indicator that, you know, if you, if you translate your content into that language, you should see an increase in conversion. So that's probably the best place to start. But again, you know, some, some companies, already know that they have certain markets that they have a strong presence in, and so they want to be in those languages already. Got it. Now, one thing I talked about quite a lot was content, because I guess I wanted to underline that this big content challenge, which everyone faces anyway, even if they're only marketing in one language, just becomes even more pressing if you're marketing a number of languages. So mm. do you have suggestions about some of the best practices for scaling your e-commerce content for new languages? Absolutely. And, you know, we have a, a term internally here at SmartLang is the minimum viable content. And, and what that means is 
when you have so much content on your site, particularly e-commerce sites where I, I used to work at Ralph Lauren, for example, and we had thousands of, of SKUs on the website, how do you decide which content you're going to want to translate, especially if you're new to localization? So oftentimes when we talk to customers, uh, the really savvy ones think about their content in terms of prioritization and that minimum viable content. So how, what's the content that you absolutely need to translate to get the most, the most bang for your buck? So for example, translating the product copy of your top 40 or 100 products is would be much more valuable to your business than translating, you know, the long tail bottom 2,500 SKUs that maybe get only one purchase a year. Another example, you know, these are extreme examples, but to give another one is, you know, your top navigation on your website is probably the most important part of your website to translate, particularly the checkout button and the checkout workflow and the My Account section. These are really critical revenue driving parts of your website. And that would probably be a lot more important important than translating your blog archives from four years ago. And same goes with the, your blog content or other content of the sort. Uh, the, the more high value content that's really driving the most conversion on your site is what should be prioritized. And that way you can save on not having to translate absolutely everything on your site and you can start small but still get the most bang for your buck. And that seems to fit in with the triage idea I was talking about. That mm. obviously there are some translations op translation options out there which might not provide you with the top quality, but also they're not going to be quite as expensive. And there must be some types of web content which is not critical, where you could get away if necessary without sourcing it, taking some time. You know, it's not time critical. It's not urgent to your campaigns or your or your messaging. Does that make any sense? Taking a sort of triage approach. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great point as well, Kim. So the way we look at that is, you know, oftentimes a lot of customers come to us thinking, you know, I need the full traditional process for translating my content. So having a translator, a, an editor, and a reviewer, and they have to translate all the content on the site. So I mentioned before the prioritization of content. Now there's also the prioritization of content according to how you want it translated. So like you mentioned, there might be some content on your site, like maybe some technical specifications that aren't that important to the buying process or the older blog archives or some other more buried content or user generated content that might not be absolutely critical for your marketing or conversion efforts. And so with those, oftentimes the, the savvier brands will consider using machine translation or a machine assisted translation or maybe just have a translation of that content without the additional cost of the editor and reviewer so that they can save a little bit on cost, understanding that that content isn't as critical as some of the more important content on the site. So with that, we absolutely do have customers that utilize all sorts of different translation methods so that they can optimize their ROI and keep it balanced with their cost. Uh, that gives me an opportunity to uh, try and make a clear distinction. I don't know if I made it clear enough in my presentation. You talk about machine translation. That's You're literally talking about feeding text into a machine. I, we've all used um, these online things like Babelfish and so on, and a machine will, will send you back uh, a version in whichever language you've selected. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, when we talk about using automation to get high quality translations done more quickly when it comes to the possibility of crawling a client's web content to automatically identify things which need to be translated. That has the elements of automation, but you're sending it to human translators. Have I got the right idea? Yes, absolutely. So, well, this uh gets us into all sorts of interesting topics. So I'll answer the first part of your comment about machine translation. So we, we've been reading a lot in the news lately. There have been a lot of really interesting developments that have been happening with machine translation and neuromachine translation, um, as well as translation 
assisting tools or computer assisted translation tools, which all help translators better do their job. So by providing them with either suggestions for translation or tapping into tools like translation memory, which is content that's already been translated in the past, that as the translator starts typing it in or the computer will detect that the content is the same as something that's already been translated so they don't have to retranslate it. So that saves brands significantly on cost. Now, on the second part of that, talking a little bit more about the difference of the automation of a software technology like SmartLang. So the way we view ourselves is that we are tech-enabled services. So our platform sits on top of your CMS systems, and it detects the content that changes. So if you are a content editor and you go into your system and you make a change to a few words or you have to update some information that's now changed about the product, our system detects that change and automatically pulls that into the system and pings the translators in those languages for them to then go in and make the appropriate translations for that new type of content or for that edit in the content. So all of that happens automatically as opposed to without using any sort of technology software or translation tool like that, you might not ever know that there was a change in the source content and the English content, and how would the translator then know to change it in the French and, version, and German versions. So there is a huge benefit in using a translation software for brand consistency and integrity across all of your different locales. That's exactly what I was trying to get at when I was using the phrase crawling the content. I think you explained mm. it really clearly. Um, got a great question coming in from the audience here. What's the best way to identify appropriate SEM terms in other languages? The best way to identify appropriate SEM terms in other languages. So there are several SEM and SEO companies that we also partner with, and they specialize in the international SEM and SEO and search engine marketing specifically, and they can provide that expertise to say, you know, just as you do here in the U.S. when you do your keyword research, doing the same thing in international markets. And so there are several agencies that we partner with, and we can certainly put folks in touch with them, and they specialize in exactly that. And we partner up with them so that they can also provide that expertise to our customers to help them be successful. Okay, uh, another question here. Uh, several options were outlined to handle translations. Do you have a specific example, a specific example of a successful approach to handling ongoing translations into five plus languages? Sorry, say that again. Yeah. Um, do you that? have a yeah. sure? I think this is asking uh, if you have any use cases in mind. Do you have a specific example of a successful approach? to handle ongoing translations into five or more languages? To handle ongoing translations? Yes. Yes. Well, we, we certainly have several customers that do, uh, for example, intercontinental hotel groups uh, translates into dozens of languages, and they have ongoing translations, and of course, you know, they have very robust websites and mobile applications, and they're translating into all of these languages, and there's constant updates. If you consider a hotel website, how many deals and packages that they have going on at different seasons, for different holidays, for different regions and different markets, all of that is constantly being updated and needs to be considered and localized. And so by using, they would never be able to do that manually, of course, if you think about translating into 22 or 40 languages. So using a translation software like SmartLang, we're able to create, or they're able to create within the system themselves, multiple workflows to be able to address the needs for all those different countries. And same goes for another uh, great customer example, and we also have case studies for both of these on our website, is Hootsuite, the popular social, uh, social media management channel. And they do the same thing, and they are in, in multiple languages as well, and 11 languages for Hootsuite, so that they can, of course, enable communication and social media engagement with audiences in all those different markets. 
I was wondering if you something you'd also come across. I, I have spoken to um, financial institutions who are actually in the U.S. are looking for looking to expand their market in certain language speaking groups. I mean, simply there are banks looking for more Hispanic customers. Are you are you finding a demand for these kinds of service, uh, services within national boundaries as well as across boundaries? For within national boundaries, absolutely. It's very common for banks, for example, to be expanding into Spanish-speaking audiences or you know, Chinese um, or Japanese and multiple other languages where there are large communities within the United States. And we see this as well in other countries where they want to target a specific demographic within their borders. Uh, also, for example, we find that for Canada, this is a great example, that for those companies there that oftentimes they want to translate into English and also French Canadian, which is has differences from French spoken in France. And same goes for British English versus American English. And so there's a lot of these nuances um, within the same language group, but for different markets that would differ. And then also within countries where they have smaller communities that they want to translate specifically for. You also see this oftentimes with uh, government, municipal, and uh, uh, statewide government groups where they are translating now. If you look at several of these websites, they are translating into multiple languages in support of these local audiences that speak other languages. That's actually a great example I hadn't thought of because I, you know, I spoke about the relevance of e-commerce practices uh, increasingly for nonprofits, but uh, yeah, for government authorities as well. Increasingly, I, I was talking to someone um, who was the uh, CTO for a very large county in Wisconsin, and uh, he was saying you have to take it step by step. There are many agencies involved. There are many sensitivities. You can't just tell people we're switching to an e-commerce model. But nevertheless, you know, digital marketing, the lessons to be learned from that are easily deployed within a, a governmental context, especially because although they're citizens rather than consumers in that context, people still come with, a, with the same kinds of expectations when, when they're engaging with their local government online. And of course, being met in their preferred language is going to be one of those expectations. Yeah, absolutely. Now, something I, I didn't get deeply into, but which I wanted to ask you about, is apps. Because, of course, apps are you know, a huge opportunity for, uh, for, for e-commerce. Do we apply the same principles there? Or are there significant differences? Are, are there things which you really can't do with apps, which you can do with web content? So, yes, yeah, so apps are a little different than web content, and we do apply many of the same tools for uh, businesses that are mobile app. Uh, we have several, actually, app-specific tools in our platform that can support the apps, so mobile applications like in-app review. Uh, as you can imagine, or as some of you may know this, languages like German are 30% longer than English. So if you're translating into German, you have to be able to see how that's going to look on the screen because a small screen on mobile, it, you know, that's a lot, that's a very limited amount of real estate. So having a, a tool like in-app review where you can see, the, the translator can see exactly how their translation will show up on the screen and they can QA it there, then they can make adjustments if they see that the words aren't fitting on the screen or it's running over or it's breaking other parts of the app. Uh, additionally, we also have some tools that help to update content on mobile apps uh, without having to go through the App Store. So for example, we have the Mobile Delivery Network, which is a tool that is a tool that allows you to update any change, make edits, or launch a new website uh, or a new language for your app. 
uh, over the air. So it's an over the air update and it does it uh, automatically. So literally your user will open up the app the next time and they will see that change in that language directly. But in terms of the overall strategy on how to select your languages and, and monitoring your budget and ROI, you know, a lot of those principles are the same across web applications and websites as well. But we do have those additional tools available because we understand that mobile apps have certain distinct differences from websites. Got it. Um, another question coming in. How can you make sure your translation is the right translation and not a Google translation? That's an interesting question. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of things baked in there. So how can you make sure it's a Google translation or a actual human okay. translation? How can you make sure that it's right and that somebody's not just feeding you, a, you know, a machine Google type translation? How do you know you're getting a quality product? I guess is the question. Okay, that's that's interesting. So the way that we would do that here at Smartling is that we have a trusted network of professional translators that we work with. So we do have some agencies that we've partnered with, but for the most part, we go directly to the translator. So and we also have a self monitoring process where we evaluate all the translators on their translations. And it's, it's kind of like, think of it as a peer review process. So different translators are reviewing each other so that we can make sure that their translations are correct. And in addition to that, most workflows using professional translators also include an editor who can catch those mistakes and a reviewer in that language. So again, for the high value content for e-commerce customers, they would typically use that, what we call T-E-R process, so the translation editor review process to then be able to um, or TEP for proofreader, to be able to assure that the translation is really good and it's the highest quality possible. So that's one way to do it. You know, if you know that you don't care about the translation quality so much for that piece of content, you know, you can create that workflow for the machine translation. But typically, if you're going to have a translator, you want to make sure that you're working with a company like Smartling that has this quality assurance baked into our network of professional translators that really guarantees that quality. Something um, I touched on, because I, I'm sure it's important, but maybe we could examine it a little bit more, is, is the cultural question. Because if you're talking about localization, meeting people in the way they want to be met in the right language, you've got to be careful also to do it in a way which is appropriate to their culture. I think I gave a couple of examples. but. But it's obviously a benefit to you if you can go to a service which has uh, knowledge, understanding of these cultural nuances. Is there any role which technology or automation can play in uh, getting you more quickly to a position where you know your content is culturally appropriate? Okay. Well, in terms of automation, I mean, certainly having the workflows and having your translators working within the same platform as your project managers or your content creators in the source language is a huge benefit there. Like, again, with localization, when if you have a translator for a language, they know to translate the currencies and measures and dimensions and times and dates um, and even the specific types of language on certain imagery, which might change as well, um, because that would be part of that process. But in addition to that, one of the tools that a good translation software would also offer translators to help with this, and I think this, this answers your question more specifically, is tools like having glossaries and style guides. So a someone in the, the brand manager, for example, for a certain e-commerce company that we work with will build out a style guide that will specifically tell the translator, refer to this word like this, or you know, when you're translating it, we want it to have this meaning, or here's a glossary of a term, and so make sure that you know it, it has that same meaning, so that then you have that consistency of the brand 
across the different languages. Additionally, there are certain agencies or translators that specifically focus on what is called transcreation, which is the, literally it means the translation and localization of specific brand words, right? So in the Nike tagline, just do it, probably wouldn't translate directly and literally into French. So it would need some sort of transcreation so that it has, it makes more sense to resonate with that audience. I think I saw an example which made me laugh out loud in a, a blog which Smartling published. Is it uh, the, something like the Green Giants came out when literally translated into another language as something like the Intimidating Ogre or something like that? Yeah. It, just, I mean, it was literally yeah. but it was completely the wrong message. <laughs> Yeah, we do see that a lot. There's a lot of really funny sort of localization fails that you can find across the Internet. Uh, one of my favorite is the uh, floor sign, you know, when it, the floor is being cleaned in an office building and it says execution in process, um, in progress. <laughs> Uh, as opposed to saying, you know, it's a, <laughs> a cleaning in, pro in progress. So That's remarkable. I'm, yeah. I was just wondering... <laughs> How, how much is, is this, this kind of approach we're talking about, how much is it available to uh, medium-sized businesses? Businesses which, I mean, they, they may not be the biggest businesses around. They may have fairly lean teams. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. a lot of their commerce is, is coming from uh, markets which are using different languages. Is it really available to them or is this really an enterprise tool? For SmartLink specifically, we offer we offer tools for businesses of all sizes. So we actually rolled out a few months ago, and we now offer uh, multiple price points for different aspects of our tools so that we can provide the service for everyone. So for smaller businesses, we have a free essential plan, which gives the basic workflow tools and access to our network of translators so that small businesses that are just getting started but they understand the importance of going out the gate internationally, that they can already be able to access um, access these benefits. Additionally, we have other, you know, slightly more expensive plans and paid plans that aren't at the enterprise level, but that provide flexibility for medium-sized businesses, um, you know, B2B SaaS businesses or also smaller e-commerce companies that are now at the point where they want to, you know, they're at that tipping point to start moving into one or two languages. And so we have also some tools there, our, our pro plan as well as our business plan, which then start to give you access to some interesting parts of our platform, such as the connectors, um, as well as the mobile delivery network and some of those mobile tools I talked about before. But most importantly, our APIs and our connectors. So we have... Um, you can integrate into uh, the SmartLink platform into your Sitecore or Adobe Experience Manager or Hybris or WordPress or any number of different tools or CMS systems that you use. So that those are that that's really important for mid-sized businesses because they're already using a number of of content management systems and different tech tools, and so they're already starting to build up a pretty robust tech stack, and we can seamlessly integrate into that at that level. So to answer your question, it doesn't just have to be enterprise folks that are coming to SmartLing. We have plenty of smaller and mid-sized businesses that have global aspirations and are very ambitious, and they already have the tools available to them. Okay. I, the audience is joining in here. They, they came up with another great example. The Nova car marketed in Mexico. <laughs> of course, in Spanish, that means Nova, don't go. Yeah. <laughs> yep, okay. that's a great example for sure. <laughs> um, you know, and I've, I've uh, heard some other funny examples recently, uh, some, one, one of which I would, I would love to say, but I don't think it's appropriate enough. <laughs> Um, of a forum, but yeah, you know, at times you find that certain brands come up on that issue, and and one of the brands I'm thinking of right now, they uh, had an issue going into one market where their brand name was very similar to a inappropriate act <laughs> that uh, in that market would raise a lot of questions, similar to Nova for the Chevy Nova. 
So, uh, and they actually decided to still go into that market, but uh, they decided to do it by creating some really compelling visual context that actually did a very funny and witty um, play on words with their brand name as a way to kind of stand out. Now, they are also a smaller tech startup. Actually, they're pretty large, so they're a mid-sized <laughs> tech startup, um, and, they, and they have a very good sense of humor, and they have a very fun brand, and so for them, it worked very well. So for other brands, that might be something that they need to consider in terms of their brand messaging and position. If it's a more serious brand or higher-end luxury brand, they might want to think twice uh, before they go into that market or perhaps have some sort of uh, translation or transcreation of their brand name. <laughs> Absolutely. And well, you touched on Hootsuite earlier, and I was thinking more generally about social. If a brand's engaging on social media, responding to comments, they're tracking their brand reputation, seeing what conversations are going on, if they decide to engage, and you know that, again, that's something, if you're only worried about one language, engaging on social media these days is uh, quite a science and a, a difficult thing to, to always get right. Now, is it possible to... Uh, I, I, are there w solutions which make it easier for you to engage on social media in an appropriate language? Or re is it really the only way to do it, to have someone sit in there who, who speaks the language the conversation is happening in? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting point. Now, I, I haven't... I haven't uh, directly consulted on the social media piece in terms of localization, but yes, you would need someone who is native in that language if they are doing very regular uh, communication with customers on social. I would say that you know, customer is the forefront of your brand. Uh, you are going to want to have someone in that language and appropriately responding to them. Now, if you are a brand that you are more U.S. centric, uh, more English is really the primary language that you are interacting with on social media. You know, maybe you're considering going and having handles in other languages, like a French version or a Japanese version. You know, maybe it's easier. Maybe your strategy for social media is just to push out, you know, product information or you know your newest product catalog and. Uh, anything else uh, related to that. So if, you're, if you have more of a push strategy, then that would be easier to be able to pre-translate that content and then schedule it into you know, a platform like Hootsuite or Sprout Social. Um, but if you are doing live communication with customers, you're going to want to have that person be in the local market and speak the language and be able to communicate with them directly. Um, because otherwise, if you're not getting back to that customer quickly enough and you're waiting for a translation of a, you know, to come through, you, you might miss an opportunity there with that customer. So I would say that having someone in market is really critical for live social media. That makes a lot of sense. And I guess I, I shouldn't speak as if all social media is the same because if it comes to Facebook, maintaining a Facebook page, a Facebook presence, then you really are going to a, be able to use uh, a lot of the same tools that you're using for your e-commerce pages generally. And uh, what you're saying, of course, is is very relevant if it's a matter of a live conversation on something like something mm -hmm. like Twitter. Oh, no, for I sure. Just, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. No, please. <laughs> um, just uh, to the audience, we are running out of time, so if you do have any other questions, please uh, send them in, and now will be a good time. I was just wondering, you know, I had a kind of crazy example in my slide set of a page of Albanian. Any thoughts on what are some of the more unlikely requests uh, you've had to deal with at Smartling when it comes to languages for translation? Oh, uncommon languages that we've come on, yeah. come upon or been asked? Exactly. You know, I can't say that, you know, the way we see it is that we are able to facilitate translation and help with translation in any language in which a translator exists. So I, I almost can't even consider, 
you know, what would be one of the more exotic or different languages or uncommon languages that we've helped translate into because we've, we've helped companies translate into hundreds of languages. Uh, but I will tell a story that uh, early on in Smart League's history, uh, when they were trying to, when Jack Weldy, our, our founder, was doing a demo of our product, I know that he translated uh, prospects. Uh, website into Klingon. I think it was a tech <laughs> startup, and he thought that would be kind of funny. Um, and it, it was very effective when suddenly you open up your website, you see an instance of your website all translated into Klingon. Um, and so, of course, we did that on a, a staging environment. It wasn't live, and no one visiting the site could see it. But uh, it was a very powerful sort of tool to be able to show, like, you know, we could even translate into languages that don't exist. So. <laughs> Okay, somebody in the audience is interested in the points you made about transcreation, and they're asking mm. whether there are transcreation agencies which you'll partner with, or are you doing transcreation uh, via SmartLing in the same overall workflow system as the rest of what you do? Well, so transcreation is a, a type of translation, right? So for us, we, like I mentioned before, we have this network of professional translators. We have thousands of translators that we directly connect with the brands that we work with. And yes, within that network, we absolutely have pr professional folks who do specifically transcreation, and we put our customers in contact with them all the time so that they can have all those transcreation needs addressed. So we do work directly with smaller agencies as well as the individuals themselves that can provide that service. Excellent. I'm just kind of, of summing up. This has been a very useful conversation for me, for me because I, it's honed my understanding of just the ways in which technology can make it easier for brands to meet these challenges, but that at the same time you're not losing the human touch because the expertise of the translators and the people who are culturally aware has to be in there, and it can be in there affordably if you distinguish between the really important high quality messaging, the important parts of your web page, and those parts where you can perhaps afford to, to cut a few corners, save a little money. So it's, it's interesting how this all fits together. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle trying to get all this right. I was just wondering if, Juliana, if you have any, any final thoughts on the opportunities for brands who are, who are doing this kind of translation. No, I, th I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, it's absolutely, there's a lot more nuance within translation than I think a lot of brands recognize, and there's always that myth around, like, oh, if I don't translate every single piece of content, then forget it. Like, then it's not worth doing at all, and that's not true. There's a lot of nuance there in terms of translating some content, starting small, and then you start expanding later into the rest of your content catalog or into your product catalog, and so that's really important to consider that translation doesn't need to be considered an all-or-nothing proposition and that it can be approached strategically so, as you mentioned, you can save on a lot of cost. And ultimately, tapping into a translation software system, you are helping to automate a lot of cumbersome manual processes that requires a lot of resource internally, either from dev teams or from project managers or a ton of other people that get involved. And by having a system like this in place, you can eliminate, and we've, we've been able to eliminate, up to 90% of that manual process for customers. And, and additionally, I would say for any brands out there who are still trying to think about what that opportunity looks like in terms of localizing in foreign languages, uh, one of our, one of the industry analysts, a uh, common sense advisory uh, has a, a very interesting statistic, which is that 75% of buyers agree or strongly agree that when faced with the choice of two similar products, they're more likely to purchase the one that has product information in their own language. So that's very compelling that you have the majority of folks are more willing to spend money and to convert if they have that content in their language. I bet that's right. And, and I must say, if it fits in very well with what I, I hear about things like the content challenge or marketing technology challenges generally, that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You don't look at 
all the uh, challenges facing you and say, I give up. You can start small, start where it works, start where you can show an ROI, start making a difference, and expand from there. Absolutely. That's right. Well, thanks, Juliana, for this conversation. It's been very illuminating. I hope everyone who's listening in has enjoyed it and benefited from it. And I will let everybody get on with the rest of your afternoons. This is Kim Davis for DMN. Check us out at DMN every day for more on marketing technology, marketing operations, and everything that's happening out there. Thank you for joining us, and goodbye. <laughs>